All right, folks, I'm thinking the other breakout room might just be ending now because I'm starting to see people join back into this main session. And I do want to make sure we're keeping the trains on time for people who are planning around individual sessions. So I'm going to go ahead and say it's time for us to get to our general tech tips from our co-founder, Eric Dreyer. Eric, very exciting to have you. Thank you. That's very, very exciting to be here. I'm um, only mildly disappointed that you don't have your co-host, uh, your son, who joined us briefly the other day, um, but it's fine. I guess he's probably not so much on the tech tips as of yet. Not yet. No, we, we start him early, but uh, six weeks is a bit early. We may have a surprise visit from my daughter, who is 18 months because uh, she's upstairs napping. But that I, I think we've scheduled the nap around this session, so I think we might be good on that front. Yeah, good. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen to let you share yours so that you can run the show here. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Let me get this going. All right. That should uh, be every uh, everything we need to see. Let me just make sure my whole setup here is going to be helpful. As we go throughout this. Um, all right. Well, welcome everyone. Let's see, why am I not in one second here? I know we have some people trickling in, so I'm just going to try and pull up this. Lost my. I want to be able to view the. Um, Well, I've lost it for some reason. Somehow this is missing. So if you're chatting at the moment, I am unable to see it. I'm going to ping Karen and see if I can't figure out how to um, pull that thread I've got up. The chat up. I've got the chat up on my end, so I can make sure I monitor that ah. so that questions at the end, I can just feed them to you if that's helpful. Yeah, that totally works. Um, excellent. Well, that in that case, then I'll just kind of get rolling here. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, general tech tips. Uh, we thought this was going to be kind of a, a helpful session for you all. Uh, even my team that's joined because there's always, you know, methods and ways of learning a bit more about the technology that we use. Um, we generally geek out about a lot of the creative things that are being done just in the general tech world and quickly fold those into um, our lives. And I know that sometimes it's a little bit harder to, to always be on the uh, up and up with the newest trend or the latest software or whatever. So we're just going to kind of um, go over some simple things, some moderately complex things, and perhaps introduce you guys into some new concepts um, that we at Good Shuffle at least abide by or subscribe to. And for the most part, most of our employees are, are using in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, the goal here, right, is to just introduce you to concepts uh, that will have you either working more quickly, more efficiently, cluing you into something you generally didn't know about. Um, and this could apply to Good Shuffle, but in general, it's really meant to apply to your, your daily life. Um, so there are some general concepts I think that might be helpful to understand as we go through this, right? Technology, though it doesn't always seem that way, is here to help us. Uh, so if it is not, if it is causing you a sore spot, if it's causing you more headaches, perhaps it's the wrong piece of technology, or perhaps it just makes uh, it needs a little bit more time for you to dive into it and really learn the tools. You know, when we adopt a new tool at Good Shuffle, the first thing we have to do is fully learn how to use it to justify why we're paying to use such a tool. Um, so that, you know, so obviously something to keep in mind. Um, we like to think at Good Shuffle that we should be letting the technology do the work for us so that we can do all the things that technology can't do, right? Like strategize and think creatively. Um, and finally, there is a concept of like cognitive load, right? You're going about your day-to-day -day business. You've got, you know, shoot, a pandemic to worry about. You've got bills, you've got employees, you've got your family, lots of stuff going on. Simple things in technology really shouldn't be a part of that. Spoiler alert, I'm gonna be talking about passwords here. So if you're going about your day-to-day -day and you're like, gosh, really, I don't think about it, but you know, when you bring it up, passwords really are such a sore spot for me. Um, cool, we're gonna introduce them to some new concepts, but really, the lesson here is to identify that, yeah, that really is a problem. I really wish I could just absolve myself of this like perpetual password problem that I have uh, and start to research some tools and see what's out there to maybe really, you know, relieve you of that, that burden. Um, we'll go over, let's see, kind of review here what we're talking about today. So 
Uh, we're going to kind of start with some basics uh, keyboard shortcuts, right? Kind of learning how to use the keyboard if we aren't already very familiar with it. Uh, we'll move on to some internet and browser hacks, which are super fun. Uh, going faster is about the hardware you have and ensuring that your tools are running at optimal performance. And then we're going to get into some things that are worth it, things that we think would be worth the extra penny to spend um, just because the amount of either A, speed, or productivity you get out of those, or maybe it reduces the cognitive load I mentioned, uh, which is passwords. So we'll talk about that. I'm sprinkling passwords in here a lot just to prep you that we will be talking about it, and we think we have some fun, novel things to, uh, to convey. Um, so with that, we can kick it off with some keyboard shortcuts. All right, so I get it. You're probably like, oh my gosh, wait, what? We're gonna be learning about keyboard shortcuts. These are really um, nothing, if you're, if you're not using them frequently or if they're kind of a foreign concept to you, this is not a hard thing to learn by any means. Very easy. It actually becomes muscle memory within like a week or two. I mean, it's that old proverb, like once you learn how to ride a bike, we and myself personally use so many keyboard shortcuts throughout the day, I actually can't even identify them. Like in creating this presentation, I probably used the ones we'll be talking about hundreds and hundreds of times because it just is such a muscle memory at this point that it's, it's easy to use, it's easy to introduce uh, to the day-to-day -day life. And once it's there, it doesn't go away. It's just ready, it's at the ready. So we'll start off with some easy ones. First of all, this is a keyboard, I'm kidding. Obviously, you guys know that, but we will be highlighting some specific keys on the keyboard. If you're on a PC, uh, there is a control button. Uh, generally, depending on the model of keyboard and or laptop you're on, it may mean different places. Usually, it's going to be right uh, along the row where the space bar is. Uh, it starts with CTRL. It's the control key. So you're going to use that in conjunction with other keys to, um, to really you know um, activate these keyboard shortcuts. If you are on a Mac, we're going to be talking about the command key, this little loop-de-loop -loop clover key that's generally always right by the space bar. Um, that's the one you're going to be clicking and holding while you click another button to activate the keyboard shortcut. OK, so for you tech whizzes out there, everything you see on the screen is, is old news. But for those that uh, are looking at these and saying, yeah, I know about these, maybe I use them through the the right click uh, button, uh, there are some faster ways to do it. And it's really, you know, kind of comes into the use cases and I'll start to get into those here in a moment. But um, as you can see, we've got two columns here. So for copy, the very first one is uh, Command C and Control C if you're on a PC. So you can kind of see those columns are designed to show you how you can achieve that depending on the operating system you're on. Uh, and before you start rolling your eyes, uh, if you already know what copy and paste is, let's just kind of get into some examples and see how we might be able to just generally use those to our advantage in our day to day. What I'll be doing is pulling up some samples here. Okay, so as you go about, oops, oh, there you go. So as you are going about using Good Shuffle on a day to day basis, let's just say you are really tired of, um, you know, seeing notes that are maybe on an item that are internal notes, but they aren't necessarily specific to that item. And you want to kind of move those from one place to the next. In this particular instance, um, I have this 10 by 10 tent, uh, and I see some internal notes here. And it's the first part of the internal note says, we need to be able to gate on the east side of the building at 8.15 AM. And then the second part of the note says, this tent needs to be set up by 9 AM. So right there, we kind of have a uh, like two use cases in one, right? These are notes. One is generally for the project. The other one is specific to this tent. I wanna move the note out uh, of that internal note that relies to the whole, or applies to the whole project. And I wanna move it over to notes. Now, some of you guys might right click and copy. There's no problem with that, but by hitting Command C or Control C on your computer and adding notes over here and Command Ving, uh, you could do it just a little bit faster. I mean, we're talking about seconds here, right? You're going from five seconds to one second, but it's really a lot of seconds as you do that multiple times in a given project or in a given spreadsheet or word processing document uh, throughout the day and coupled with all the other shortcuts, you're really saving time and able to move faster. So again, uh, you can come in and copy Command C, Command P, uh, V, and you're pasting it there. Awesome. Another way to do that, as you can see back here, uh, so that was copy and paste, is this cut and paste. Cut and paste is a two, a twofer um, keyboard shortcut. 
what you can do is you can click and highlight and use Command X or Control X to both copy and delete content and then paste it over there. So now what I didn't have to do was obviously copy, hit my keyboard, hit the backspace to delete the content and then paste. I can just do it cut and paste. And I've now moved the uh, note that applies to the whole project out into the project level notes. And I'm keeping my tent specific note where it needs to be. Um, so some easy examples there. Um, we're gonna go into undo and find. Uh, these are some really fun examples because maybe you do know about this, maybe you don't know about this. Um, I know about undo from all of my years working in Photoshop. There's just so many times you click the button incorrectly, you've added some paint somewhere or a mask and you wanna get rid of it. You, you can control Z your way out of that. Let me pull this away for a second. So we're talking about the keys control Z for undo and uh, uh, command and control F for find. And let's see how we might do that. So I'm coming into the same project and I'm, you know, maybe I'm reading through this particular item and I'm looking at the description and I say, you know what, this description, even though it's already baked into the inventory item as I saved it in my inventory, I wanna come in and edit this. I wanna change it up because this particular client, um, I wanna convey something else about this particular um, item. And so I start to just write some different text in here. And as I'm writing this new description here, which obviously isn't very illustrative, you know, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, you know what, on second thought, I want to go back and use the default description that I've added as inventory item. Uh, that is where the command Z or com, uh, control Z on, on a PC comes in handy. I can command Z my way back to a previous state. Um, there was a time where browsers weren't aware of this keyboard shortcut, but they all are there now as a modern um, feature. And so if you're coming in and making edits, this could be in an email. I'm writing up, I'm changing the default email that goes out to a client and I decide I wanna go back and undo some of those edits that I made. I can just hit Control Z uh, for, for me to go back in history. Now, a little bit of a spoiler alert here is that there is a way to undo your undos and that's by holding Shift, Command Z. So if I hold shift, I'm gonna go back and see the changes that I had made that I had undone. Think about this, like you're watching a YouTube video and you're scrubbing that, that timeline, right? You want, I wanna go back and see what they said 15 seconds ago. Okay, great, now I wanna jump forward to the place I left off from. Control Z and then shift control Z or command Z and shift command Z will allow you to kind of play back and forward the changes you've made text-wise uh, on a document, in Good Shuffle Pro, in an email, um, you know, anywhere where you generally you're kind of like editing words. Okay, keyboard shortcuts. Maybe hopefully we're starting to see some cool novel use cases here at Good Shuffle, uh, or just generally learning some of the keyboard shortcuts um, that you might not have known about. Here's something I think might be very valuable to you guys because we get a lot uh, with asking about the logs of uh, a given project, right? The logs that are at kind of monitoring or tracking every kind of click and action and addition and subtraction of inventory on a project is the find keyboard shortcut. So I'm going to pull this guy back and I'm gonna go over to this particular project. So you can see here, I'm on the logs tab of this project and anybody who's ever been here knows uh, at their core that there is a lot of data. Like I am just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and there's a lot of logs that are occurring. A lot to sift through. People are asking, hey, can I have some sort of search functionalities, sorting and filtering, which are all very novel and unique ideas that we are eager to explore. There is something out of the gate that is already available to you from your browser, which is the find functionality. So by holding Command F or Control F, I get a little um, box that pops up out of here at the top. And it's just searching through this document. In this particular case, it's a web page for specific letters. I can look up, I happen to know, I've obviously rehearsed this, I happen to know that there's a halo vase on this item or on this project. And I can see uh, that that item, or at least it in the logs has occurred six times and I'm on the first occurrence of that word. Um, so now if you're kind of looking and seeing like, hey, I'm going into a project, I noticed somebody removed this. I only want to know when this was removed, who removed it, why did they remove it? You can come into the logs, look for the item name and quickly filter 
you know, or at least highlight, as you can see, I can scroll here and see those two examples. I can also use these arrows to navigate my way through those. So it's jumping up and down the page. You can also just hit enter and go through all those examples to really get to the core piece of information that you're looking for. Another thing that you could possibly look up is like, hey, when did the client sign this contract? So I can come in here, look up signed. Um, obviously you can see it's a couple status indicators at the top here, but if I click down to the third one, I can see more activity around when the user signed this contract. And I got to that information really quickly by using the, the find um, keyboard shortcut. And as you can see, it's halfway down this page, which I already know is really long. So certainly saved me from a lot of scrolling. Uh, this is also doable on your mobile device, but it's a little bit more specific. So I'll let you just uh, plant the nugget that you can find this on your mobile device, um, but allow you to do the research to figure that one out uh, on your own. Okay, we are just warming up here, folks. These, this is by no means the mind blowing general tech tips that we will be going over today, but at least it's a good foundation upon which we can build it. We're gonna work our way up to some more in, uh, intermediate level um, keyboard shortcuts here. Uh, and I will be jumping around from an application or two to kind of convey these. So I'm gonna pull out my project here a little bit and, you know, oops, cancel that. So let's say one of the things that we don't actually have on inventory is the ability for you to save a video um, about a particular item, service, be it, uh, you know, a tent, a table, a chair, or even a DJ. In this particular instance, I'll be referencing a DJ because how vivid can you convey the, the interactivity of a great DJ by showing somebody a video and giving an example of, of how this DJ interacts with the audience, with performs, the music selections they make, et cetera. So you're saying, all right, I've prepped a project and I'm looking to send it out to the client. And in there, you know, I really want to make sure that they see this, this DJ in action before we continue the conversation. So you can see here, I've got one of our uh, Vox DJ videos um, up and I want to send this to my client. So I'm going to copy that URL and I'm going to add it to this message as a hyperlink. I'm going to move this down a second, a hyperlink, as you can see here, a couple different ways you can do it. Um, one of which is, you know, generally through the right click menu, but you can also do it via the command K key. What a hyperlink is, is you are embedding a link to a website inside a word or a group of words. So you're hyperlinking that word into a web URL. So I wanna say, don't forget to check out this video. Sometimes you can do it by just pasting the URL there. That's not too bad though URLs as anybody who is an interneter these days know they get very, very, very long sometimes and can actually distract from the message you want to send to your customer. So I'm gonna control Z that, keyboard shortcut already right there. I'm gonna change that colon to a, uh, a period. And then I'm gonna say, check out this video. So I'm gonna highlight just this video. I'm gonna hit command K. You can see it popped up a little window and I can paste and hit enter. And now I've just created a hyperlink and you can see it as a preview over here. Like it, it's much cleaner when you embed that link in a message versus including the, the what we would call like a naked URL, uh, just because those URLs get so long, they distract from the message and it's a much cleaner way to present that. So a very easy way to do that. In this particular instance, you didn't need to use the keyboard shortcut. You can actually just use this little link key, um, but the keyboard shortcut just makes it that much faster. Moving along, we are going to talk about clear formatting and then pasting plain text. This has a little bit less to do with in Good Shuffle experiences, but more kind of something you might do with Good Shuffle data. Um, so clear formatting, uh, there's a unique key here that you might not have ever paid attention to. I can guarantee you, I never knew this thing existed until I started writing code, uh, which is the command pipe key, which is on my keyboard right above the right hand enter key, right? So it looks like it's the backslash, but it's the secondary symbol on the backslash, or maybe it's also right below your backspace key. Uh, so command um, pipe allows you to get, um, remove the formatting. Um, on a PC, I do believe in the latest version of the operating system, highlighting text and then hitting control space bar is how you are able to clear the formatting of text. Now, what are we talking about? I'm going to 
bring up this example. And in this particular instance, you've just exported all your inventory. You're doing a quarterly checkup of inventory or you're doing a yearly one, or you're just wanting to see your inventory in a little bit different manner in let's just say a, a spreadsheet. So in this particular instance, we're looking at Google Sheets. Now, what always happens in spreadsheets is people start messing up with format. And generally speaking, there's no harm, no foul there, but it does pose a little problem if you're trying to read everything easily. As you can see here, the different fonts, weights, colors, even background colors can make it really hard to parse information. Uh, and if you would like, what you could do is you could select the cell and you could go through all your options and format it that way back to its original size that you're looking for. Or what you could do in this particular, instance, I'll do it in this one cell, is hit the command pipe key and it sets it back to your documents um, default. Show you get that again, command pipe. And now it's cleared the formatting of that. You can also do that by selecting all of these cells and hitting the command pipe key and boom, everything now is streamlined. I've even left a few out down here. Very handy, I use it all the time. Generally speaking, because we're just working a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of Word documents, want to clear that formatting and just get it all standard. Helps with the readability, helps with my personal sanity um, and a very handy tool that um, once I figured out how to do it, has just become you know one of those things I'm using again a hundred times a day. I'm gonna control Z again, control Z, here we go, and show you the second option here, paste plain text. Now, in some instances, what does that mean? Well, let me just copy this. I'm gonna command C, this text here, as you can see, I got this little blue border. I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna paste it. As you can see, the formatting came along with, you know, for the ride. Sometimes that's great. Sometimes you wanna maintain the formatting and you don't want it to change. But in other instances, as we already kind of highlighted here, I don't want this formatting here. I could clear it out with the command pipe uh, or control space bar. Uh, but another way to do it would be to do it before I even paste. So if we know that paste is command V or control V on a PC, you can hold shift command V or shift control Z, Z V, sorry, and paste it without any of that formatting. So it basically knows, hey, I wanna paste that content and I wanna strip out all of that formatting um, to help with Eric's sanity in this particular instance. Okay, so intermediate uh, shortcuts there. Maybe you learned something new, maybe you learned everything new, or maybe you already do these, uh, that's, that's really awesome. I think just wrapping up keyboard shortcuts here, we're gonna talk about screenshots. Oftentimes, I think the best use case here is when you're chatting with Good Shuffle, AKA Colin, uh, and you're like, hey, can you send me a screenshot of what you're looking at? I really just wanna make sure I'm looking at the same information. Um, oftentimes we get full screenshots, right? And that's no, no harm, no foul, but really it takes a lot of time for us to look through an image to figure out really what is the, um, what is the person talking about? Uh, well, it does have the added benefit of sharing with us some of your favorite playlists, be they Taylor Swift or, or Katy Perry or otherwise. Um, which is fine, but sometimes you don't even wanna present that information, right? You wanna keep some of that stuff private. Um, so doing a screenshot of your desktop or uh, yeah, every desktop or every screen um, of just a portion of it is really, really helpful to just streamline the communication overall. Now, I'm going to be talking about how to do that on a Mac because that is what I've been operating on for 10 years, but I do know you can do it um, depending on the operating system on your PC. Um, there's a print scheme screen button generally, which will give you the full image. So that's just kind of how you get a screenshot. But you can also, I've been told, uh, hold control shift S to, and then I'll show you how this works, brings up a little like viewfinder and it says, hey, drag over a section of your screen what you want to take a photo. Um, and this is done via the snipping tool, which is a baked in tool now, I think to the Windows 10 that allows you to um, take the screenshots, but it can also be called up and opened up via a keyboard shortcut. So if you wanna go to the extra level and program that into auto pop up whenever you wanna create a, a screenshot just by hitting a command key, go for it. Um, let me show you really what that look, looks like. And I'll do the example here of uh, the project logs, right? So if I took a screenshot of my screen right now and send it over to Colin and be like, see what I'm talking about? He'd be like, I see a lot of information. I don't, I don't see what you're talking about, no. Can you take a specific screenshot that would help me uh, understand what you're looking at? And so let's just say I wanted to show 
um, that when the client signs this contract, right? So this little section that I'm highlighting here, I'll get rid of the find. So shift command four brings up this little cursor. I don't know if you can see this on, um, on the, the screen. I have a little crosshair cursor and I can just drag. And now I'm basically selecting an area on my screen and I've created a screenshot and I will open that up. And now you can see as I'm uh, presenting here, like this is just the picture that I took. It auto populates to my desktop. I can open it up. And now I can send that to columns. You're like, hey, column, look, the client signed this contract at this time via this IP address, if that was the particular information that I was trying to convey. Very, very handy. I actually use screenshots all the time because sometimes pictures are just a far easier way to convey what a long paragraph might say. Um, so a screenshot, a portion of your screen is very handy. Um, hey, Eric, the, I wanna uh, just interject really quick and let you know we got some people who are chatting in who are pointing out that on a PC, um, at least on the newer ones, that Windows plus Shift plus S is the snipping tool. That's what you can use on a Windows uh, computer to get what you- Very cool. Are doing here. Um, awesome. I will, uh, I'll put that down in the notes. That way, when we share this, we can, I can make sure I can amend the, uh, the notes there on the right side of the screen for the, for the PC crowd out there. Thank you guys. That's really helpful. Okay, moving on. We are, we have wrapped up only temporarily the keyboard shortcuts. Uh, we will talk about some internet hacks, but we will be revisiting the internet and your keyboard here momentarily. But I think I wanted to show you a really cool um, feature. If you're using Chrome, which I know is the browser that we suggest at Good Shuffle, just because of the security measures and also the speed and performance of, of our web technology, uh, you can pin your tabs. Uh, Okay, so what is that and why would I find it valuable? Well, as you can see here, this is just a little screenshot of um, some sample tabs that you could pin to your browser in Chrome. Pinning a tab means it's always going to be there. It's always going to be on the left side. So you're not clicking through all your tabs to figure out where is it, like where, where's my email, where's my calendar. Uh, and really, it helps you prioritize those sites you're visiting all the time. Additionally, when you shut down your computer and restart it, or you close your browser and reopen it, they will auto launch and they will populate before you can even get there. So it's like booting up your command system and it's right there. It's like, I would like to think hopping into a jet and turning on, you see all these sweet little dials show up. These are customizable. I'll show you how to do it. Very easy. I'll pull out my, uh, my little sample here. So I'm gonna pull in my screen here. You can see I've got five pinned tabs two email, right? My personal, my work, uh, a calendar, um, a little to-do spreadsheet that I keep, and then a good shuffle dashboard, which would be very handy. Uh, and as you can see here, I'm just gonna open up a couple new tabs. I'll get to how I'm doing this very quickly. And what's happening here is you can see these tabs take up lots of space, whereas my pinned tabs are nested over here on the left. I can drag and reorder these tabs, but I cannot make a big tab go and hang out with my pinned tabs. Um, and so it really helps create like, hey, these are my mainstay browser tabs. And these are the ones I'm like, whatever, I'm Google searching a definition of something. I'm looking up the score, scores of this game, uh, whatever it may be. Really amazing way to, um, you know, organize your browser life. And if you aren't doing it, you got to kind of manage your tabs. You know, the, these days that we're operating mostly in internet applications as opposed to desktop applications means the browser is a big, big resource on, on your Mac or PC. So keeping your tabs to a minimum will really help prevent it from slowing down and it'll be much more responsive. Um, let me show you how to create a pinned tab. I'm going to launch my projects list. And I'm going to filter this to seven days. Awesome. And now it's a big tab, as you can see, if I right click and click pin tab, boom, it's hanging out right next to my two. You know, if I'm really a person that sticks by keeping these in order, I'll know the left one is my dashboard and the right one is my project list, but I can drag and reorder these, no problem. Uh, and then if I right click and close, I can get rid of it. So pinning tabs, when we figured out how to do that, and learned that it was a feature, phenomenal feature uh, in the Chrome browser. We love using it. Um, and there's lots of use cases. So you can do it for your email, your calendar, that good shuffle dashboard, good shuffle project list, a specific project that maybe you're working on for weeks and weeks and weeks, a to-do list, your social media, uh, 
your Katy Perry playlist, whatever it would be. Um, uh, it's it's really just, you know, in that regard, the browser, the world is your oyster. You can, you can use it for whatever you would like. Um, moving on to some continued browser slash internet hacks, I will be talking again about the keyboard and how it interacts. You might've actually already seen me do these. Um, they include creating a new tab, opening something in a new tab, which you might've seen me do. I don't show you the value of that inside Good Shuffle. Um, closing a tab and then, and then inevitably, if you know how to close a tab with your keyboard, you're gonna to have to learn how to reopen that recently closed tab because you, uh, you accidentally closed the wrong one. So I'm going to go into my projects list. Now you just saw that I launched this with a new, into a new tab, because if I clicked here, it would take me to the projects list, right? But if I go and click on, um, if I hold command or control on a PC and click it, it'll open it in a new tab. And why is that really helpful? Well, here's probably the easiest example I can think of. I'm gonna filter my projects to the next seven days. I only wanna review the signed contracts. And I, I'm basically coming in, maybe it's Monday morning, I'm gonna do a review of all the projects we're coming on, make sure that all the um, I's are dotted, T's are crossed. And I've got a list here. Now, if I click this, it's gonna take me to that project, but I really wanna view all of these. So if I hold command or control on a PC and click, 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 I've got six projects loading in the background of which I didn't have to do a lot of back and forth, back and forth uh, in the browser history to access. Um, I quickly launch them and I can work from the last one to the first one, reviewing the information and ensuring it's checked, but I've done that so easily. Now I've got my, my master kind of project list going on here across my tabs. Let's fast forward a little bit in time and say that I have, um, I'm done checking these, everything's checking out. We, we got all, all the information we need. I wanna close these down really quickly. Well, you could do the X, 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 right? But as you can see, depending on the size, you can see they kind of move around our hard targets, et cetera. And not that easy. I want to use Command W, I'll move this screen here. Um, close a tab, close a tab, Command W or Control W to close out these tabs really quickly. Okay. That's awesome. So I was able to open them up in new tabs by using the command click or control click. And then by using the command W or the control W, I was able to close those out really quickly as well. Now, as I mentioned, when you become, you know, uh, a keyboard ninja with this stuff, you will inevitably close out a tab mistakenly. And there's nothing worse than trying to have to go back and log into that site, and find that page I was looking on, or you could also go through your browser history and find that page. But the real secret here is if you just use command shift T, I am now reopening my most recently closed browser tabs in the order, in the reverse order that I closed them, right? So the most recently closed is the one I will open first and then vice versa for all the other ones, which is really helpful, you know, especially if you're really trying to be good at managing your tabs, you don't really want a lot of, you know, um, additional tabs open. Uh, this is gonna be handy to pull that one back up, reload the content and, and go from there. Sometimes, I mean, I don't really know the extent to which this can go, but I have sometimes done it from 20 to 30 tabs to get back to that one that I thought I recently closed, but it turned out it was a lot longer ago and it pulls it up. So it's got a pretty long history there. I know one thing that I skipped over here, kind of minimize this, is the, um, the new tab. So the open recently closed tab is shift command T, right? Command T is just how I open up a new browser. Um, so command T really, like, I want to look up a word for me. It's always, I want to look up a spell a word. Uh, Karen's probably chuckling, chuckling because she's always spell checking myself. Um, and, but it could be the sports game. It could be whatever, Facebook, whatever you're looking at. Um, the command T is just a, such an easy way because generally if you're opening up a new tab, you're going to be typing something. So you're already at your keyboard, command T, and then you're, I mean, it auto populates you right there in, in the search bar. So you're going to be off to the races pretty quickly. So within the browser, we talked about pinning tabs, we talked about tab management from a um, keyboard perspective, uh, but also how you can open and close them, uh, launch those links in new, uh, in new windows, et cetera, all really handy stuff. Okay. I would like to say we're done with keyboard shortcuts, but not yet, but we'll get to a new one uh, next. I, uh, I'm gonna be talking about this particular use case. All right. Hopefully you guys are using good, your good shuffle on your phone. 
uh, I bet you're probably a little bit peeved that you always have to go and launch a browser and then type in good shuffle and then log in. What if I told you, you can create a shortcut on your uh, Android or iPhone uh, that will launch the web page of your choice automatically. It's like an app that you're downloading to your computer, uh, to your phone. So for those of you that are tired of going and accessing Chrome or Safari and then having to type in a URL and then log in, why don't you follow this little trick? It's going to be able to save basically a bookmark to your um, your home bar or you know, like your list of apps and you can launch it very quickly on the go. Um, in this little video demo, um, it, it doesn't really come across, but we're gonna be starting off by clicking this button down here, this is the share button down here in the bottom center of the screen. So I'm gonna click play. And I should also preface this by saying, what are we looking at here? All right, so I launched, this works in um, Safari. If you log into your account in Safari, you have this feature available to you. Um, you will log in, you will launch this share button, and from there, you will be able to save it to your home screen. Okay, so I'm about to click on this button right here. This is add to home screen. It's in the list that uh, is populated whenever you click the share button. So I'm gonna click on add to home screen. It pops up a dialogue allowing me to name this bookmark that I'm creating. And as you can see in the bottom right, we've got an app on the phone. So it says Good Shuffle Pro right there. That's really handy in and of itself. It's just gonna be at the click of a thumb effectively. You're gonna launch your, in that particular instance, your, your project list and be off to the races. It could be your dashboard, it could be a particular project, whichever you'd like. In this particular instance, I will go one step forward and I will drag it into my home bar. That way I have access to it no matter where I am on my phone. Really, really handy, saves a lot of time. I think it's probably gonna save a lot of frustration from always having to like navigate via the typical URL path. Um, so really great trick um, for you guys there who are using Good Shuffle more and more on the go on your phone. Okay, last little example here with the keyboard, I promise, but it's helpful. Um, for a couple of situations. So let's say you're on a web page and you're not sure if you're like seeing the latest information. The information is stale. I think a kind of a, a real world example might be like, let's say your son or daughter have some recent test scores. You have a web page up, but the scores haven't been posted yet. Well, when you, you know, go get a cup of coffee, come back and look at it, that page isn't necessarily gonna magically populate with those scores. You're gonna have to refresh it. But due to how browsers work and the objective of trying to deliver the best experience for you, it caches a lot of information, which just basically means it saves some files locally so that it doesn't have to download them every time you load the page and it makes your experience faster. Now, refresh, I'm sure we probably know here, there's a little icon at the top of your browser on how you can refresh a page. Uh, if you're on the keyboard, it's Command R or Control R on your keyboard. So you just can refresh the page from the keyboard. Now, if you wanna do a hard refresh, which is I wanna force this browser to load the most recent information uh, available, you can use shift command R. So I am gonna force this browser to load the most recent information. Another way to do that here is obviously we have the refresh key. If you have hold shift while clicking that, it's going to download all of the information, all of the JavaScript files, et cetera. Anything that may have been cached, it's gonna refresh that cache and get into the new information for you. Let's say you've reached out to Good Shuffle and you know uh, you asked about um, maybe it was a, a permission setting for a user or something, and that user is like still can't see what they're looking to access. Have them hard refresh. That's going to pull in all the latest information and ensure they get access to uh, the content that they were looking for. So a great little tool there. Hard refresh is generally really handy. I'm going to take a sip here while we digest what we're talking about next, which is emails. Okay, for those that either willingly or unwillingly are involved in the good shelf or the, the Google ecosystem and you have a Google domain, be it personal or for your company, you have a hack available to you. Sorry, you know, Yahoo accounts, I don't think this is available to you, but you can create multiple versions of your email. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in this particular example, let's just say my I was a very early adopter at Google and I got the eric at gmail.com email address. Well, I can squeeze in additional letters between the eric and the at symbol as long as I start off with the plus sign. So 
in these examples over here, you could see Eric plus newsletters at Gmail, Eric plus spam at Gmail, Eric plus church, Eric plus kid's name, Eric plus Nike. Okay, interesting. You say like, why, why would that be valuable? Well, if you use that trick in combination with filters inside of your inbox, inside your Gmail, it really can just organize your life out of the gate. And it takes a little upfront work. You kind of have to think about it. But um, I think probably the easiest use case to think through is for me is always spam. I don't want spam. I don't want it to hit my inbox. I don't want to even spend the time considering having to delete something. I just want to get rid of it. And if I'm signing up with something that I'm pretty certain is going to be a spam based, basically it's for free. And so they sell my information. I can use the email eric plus spam at gmail.com. Now, any of these examples I show you here will go to your inbox. You still have to set up a filter to say, hey, skip my inbox and archive this or skip my inbox and put this in my newsletters folder or my church folder or my kids names folder or Nike, for instance. Uh, another little trick that people on the internet claim to use, but I don't necessarily know that they do is you can use this whenever you're signing up for something like Nike, I'm about to buy some shoes and okay, they want my, my email. I can do Eric plus Nike and then I can figure out if Nike then sold my information because I'm getting pinged by this company I've never heard of. And it's like, how'd you get my email? And it's like, oh, I see Nike sold you my information. So this is how you create the alias. When you're in Gmail, you can go in and through the search bar at the top, there's a little arrow icon. You can load um, the, the like the advanced filter options. And here you could say, hey, in this particular instance, whenever an email comes in that is going to Eric plus spam at Gmail, that is the condition, right? Um, I don't really wanna do anything else here. I want you to skip my inbox and archive it, or I want you to star it or mark it as red, whatever you'd like to do. Um, that is how you use the email alias plus your inbox to maybe streamline your life a little bit, maybe get some more of some of the clutter or just organize it a bit better, better to your own um, interests and, uh, and, and you know, email needs. Okay, go faster. I think the, the, the best example here is, you know, if you've got a high performing car, you're gonna wanna put good gas in it. If you got a general car, you don't need that high performance gas. It doesn't know what to do with it. Um, in this particular instance, we're gonna be talking about your computer and how you can hopefully make it go faster. Okay, we all know about cleaning up your desktop. Got a little animated GIF happening here showing you that once you put all the items they don't have to necessarily be in your on your desktop. They could be in any files, but once you put them in the trash or on the PC in the recycling bin, that's a good step. At least it cleans everything up visually so you can more quickly find it. You still have to empty out the trash. I mean, just think about like, you know, you're cleaning your table at night, you put stuff in the trash, but still eventually has to go out and get go out for a garbage collection, right? You still got to empty your, um, your trash or recycling bin to get rid of those files. Just think about how many files you deleted maybe in the past day, week, month, and then think about the last time you emptied out your trash. Maybe you haven't ever done it. And so you've got a whole list, hundreds and hundreds, thousands and thousands of files that are just sitting there, not doing you any favors, you need to get rid of them. Freeze up a lot of bandwidth on your computer to better process information. You're not junking it up with unnecessarily, especially large files, right? Video files, Photoshop files, whatever you might be using. Make sure you delete the trash, get rid of it. It'll make things go faster. Okay. This seems kind of like a no-brainer, but it's hard. It's hard to uh, it's hard to always remember to do this. You need to put your computer to sleep. You, you need to restart it. Um, we'll start with with a progression here. Putting a computer to sleep just ensures, I think, primarily that it's not eating away at the battery. So if you're low on battery on your computer, you know you're maybe working remote and you're about to go grab some lunch. Uh, put it to sleep. It'll it'll reduce the um, the wear on the battery. It'll save your power for when you come back. You can use it. Um, and so that's, um, you know, the good instance there is like a quick break. Maybe you're just stepping away to go to the bathroom and you come back. PCs and, and Macs uh, both have that available to them. With regards to hibernate, this is a very specific thing on, on the PC, but it's really intended for longer um, time away from your computer. So perhaps you're maybe not uh, just grabbing lunch in the office, but you're actually going out to a lunch meeting. Um, so like, you know, a couple hours is a great time to hibernate your computer and give it some rest, reduce the wear on that battery but most importantly, restarting that computer. I mean, at the very least, you should be doing it weekly. Um, I do it generally every three days, just because we use so many programs that over time, 
you know, the backlog uh, of information that's processed by your computer, it just kind of starts to wear down. Giving it a restart at the beginning of maybe a very busy day, a day that you are giving a, a user summit, uh, ensures that all your programs, Zoom, browser, et cetera, are all performing optimally. So just restarting your computer can really make things go faster. And the dust. All right, so let's talk about the dust. Like these cans of, you know, compressed air, right? It actually has a pretty significant purpose. Just like the air filter system in your house, right? If that thing's clogged, it's not doing you any favors. More importantly, when it comes to your computer, if it is dusty, if it is sitting under your desk in a corner, you know, maybe you have some pets, there's pet hair around there, there's a problem, right? The air can't, anytime you hear a computer, you hear it running, those are fans. Those fans are doing one very important work and they're trying to cool that computer down. Uh, because obviously running these computers, these really advanced pieces of machine machinery uh, gets really hot. So those, can, those fans are very necessary to reduce the speed, uh, uh, reduce the uh, heat going on. If your computer notices it's getting too hot, it will throttle itself. It'll slow down intentionally to prevent it from crashing, from it frying a circuit, right? You don't want it to get too hot in there. So something as simple as compressed air, wiping things down will remove the the uh, blockage of airflow, which will allow that air to cool down your computer and prevent the throttling. So in this case, dust uh, equals blocked airflow, equals higher temperatures and a throttled system. So something that you may not have thought about, maybe you're always kind of wondering why they're always selling these cans of press, compressed air. It has a real world application and it is to clean that computer out in addition to maybe your keyboard or some other things around on your desk. Okay, this is a fun part here. I hope to either encourage you guys to, to do some best practices or maybe to splurge on yourself and really, uh, you know, move forward in your tech enabled life. Uh, the first question we're going to ask you here is what happens if your computer crashes today? Okay, that's probably not gonna be a great thing, right? We live, we operate, we work in and around our computers all the time. If it crashed, a lot of you guys would lose your lifeline. That would be really tough for you. Uh, you don't wanna be in a position where that information is lost forever. You do, whoops. You need to get an external hard drive and you need to back up regularly. I know this is like the doctor telling you you need to eat more spinach and, and you know get all your vitamins, but it, it's, it's the recommended best practice for a very good reason. Computer is technology. It breaks sometimes, not all the time, but it will. You don't want to be caught in the wrong position. I know on some of the sessions we were talking about the other day, what happens, you know, it's like, what happens if the worst thing happens? Like in this particular instance, if your computer goes down, you're going to lose access to a lot of really important information, right? Most things, Good Shuffle included, are cloud-based, right? That's one of the benefits of cloud, cloud-based systems. I can access Good Shuffle on any computer. It doesn't have to be on this specific computer. Uh, but for the things that you are downloading to your computer, maybe it's a bunch of documents. Maybe it is a bunch of photos. I now have two children. Uh, I have a lot of photos. I want them, you know, not necessarily in the cloud. Maybe I want to be editing them on my computer. Maybe I'm editing stuff, right? Like there's a lot of things that you might be keeping on your computer you don't want to lose, especially if you're going to have your computer around for a while, man. You build up, you know, megs and megs and megs of, of files that you don't want to lose. Backing it up is really simple. These, these, um, um, hard drives that you use, you just plug them into a USB. For the most part, it does the rest. You might have to set it up. But I know on a Mac, there is something called a time machine. It reminds me every two weeks, hey, make sure you've got the latest update or like you have it backed up. It's sitting right here. It's mounted right underneath my laptop. I just plug it in and I forget about it. I don't have to do anything else. It just does the work for me. But that way I know I've always got a fresh version of all the files on my computer that I've been saving here in the event that something bad happens. These, uh, I should also mention, I was doing a quick look. Hard drives are not that expensive. I think pretty accessible and more than enough power for you, 50 to 75, even hundred bucks at Best Buy. And you've got the thing you're gonna need uh, for the next five years, you should be good. Okay, second monitors. For those that are working on a laptop, laptops are fun, they're amazing. They can go anywhere. Um, oftentimes when you're back at your home base, maybe it's at the office or you know at home, especially since it's during the pandemic, Adding an additional monitor is going to be one of those splurges that you didn't know you needed until you have it, and then you will not be able to go back, I promise you. 
I think the most appropriate analogy here is imagine that time when you were a kid, you grew up in a twin bed, right? And then eventually at some point you were able to buy your own bed. So you're like, all right, maybe I'm getting a queen or a full. And you're like, my goodness, there's like so much more room here. And then just imagine if for those of you who have a king bed, when you went from that queen bed to the king bed and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm never going back. That's like, that's an impossibility. Same thing with extra monitors. Uh, this presentation that you can kind of probably see during do the orientation is a very large monitor that I have next to my laptop here. At my office, I have another monitor on top of that one. So I have three monitors at all times, generally speaking, at the office. Most Good Shuffle employees have at least two, if not three. I think the average is we have two and a half monitors per person. The extra real estate can really do a lot for you. Think about you know, um, being able to customize your own dashboard, right? Like over here, I've got all my emails. Over here, I've got my project list maybe. Over here, I've got my social media. You know, for my dev team, they've got all kinds of monitors and, and tools up. Um, it's it's literally like they're like in some uh, like big spy movie with all these like monitors and, and the data that they're, they're looking at. Um, this is really, really handy. Generally speaking, monitors aren't that expensive. Um, some of you may even already have some that are just lying around from an old computer. You can plug it in, see if it works out of the box and, and create a really great experience for you. It just allows you to get so much done. As an example, when Good Shuffle went over to working remotely as a result of the pandemic, everybody's first question was like, when can I get my monitor? And maybe when can I get my second monitor? That was the first request uh, from everybody. So we made sure everybody had what they need, uh, they needed. So. A second monitor, great splurge. It's really just gonna free up nice real estate for you and allow you to work more efficiently. You won't do the, what browser was that in? I lost that tab, where did that go? Oh my gosh, I can't find anything. It doesn't happen anymore when you've got enough monitors. All right, I'm happy that we're coming up roughly on the 10 minute mark left because we need to talk about something serious. It's your password. Uh, I, I'm sure since I can't see chat at the moment, I'll, I'll have Karen chime in with maybe the amount of people that are responding here, but it, give us a little thumbs up or say yes, or if you any if any or all of these have you've experienced in like the past week, right? You've, you knowingly use a weak password, right? You admit it's not a strong password. It's the one you remember, but it's not strong. That, that is me, I still do it, but I have measures against that now. Uh, you've given your password to others, right? Your significant other. Uh, your maybe a teammate, a good shuffle, you guys share the same login, right? Or at, at your company. Uh, yeah, well, the vulnerability to any and all of this is the person, right? We are the worst part about creating passwords and there are solutions for that. If you reuse the password from one website to the next, there is a reason why that's a bad idea. You know, if you're using that same password on LinkedIn, they had that famous hack a few years ago. Now, anybody that had your email and password is just gonna, through brute force technology, try all these other websites to see what else they can gain access to. Uh, maybe as a result of you trying to, you know, follow some of the advice of creating a stronger password on each unique website, you've had to reset your password because no way you remember the password you created a year ago. Like it was at one time, I was still figuring this all out and I have to reset my password. I'm only imagining that all of you are, at least have experienced one, if not all of these. I have done every single one of these probably in the past week. Um, so I'm guilty, and, but there are better ways to do this. Uh, and that is something called a password manager. If you've never heard about a password manager, I will take a moment to talk about them with you. If this is the 10th time you are hearing about a password manager and you're like, all right, cool, this is the time I'm gonna do it. It will help you. Let's just talk about the benefits of a password manager before I explain what it is. Remember the cognitive load, you're walking around anytime you have to go to a new website and you're like, or a website you have visited in six months and it's like, hey, enter your password. And you're like, oh, I cannot remember what this password is. That problem is no more because you've stored all of your passwords in a central location. Uh, you only have to remember one password with password manager. Uh, it remembers all the other ones, but let's talk a little bit about what a password manager is. It is a program you download on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, whatever device you use. It has one login that you remember that you should work to make very as complex as you can remember. And once you've logged in and it's on your phone and you've got like the face ID and everything, you don't even have to remember your password, it just logs you in and it stores all your you know, login, uh, email and password um, information in you know, the most secure ecosystem possible. It's like military grade level password or technology like security. So you can now on any device log into any website you, you would like because you can 
um, get access to that information via your password manager. Some of the benefits of a password manager. You only have to remember one password. It's the one darn difficult password that you create yourself that only you know, and that gets you access to all your other passwords. When you are logging into or creating an account, for instance, uh, on a new website, and you need to create a password, this password manager will generate a password for you. You don't even have to be tasked with typing in and coming up with creative. You certainly can if you'd like, but you don't have to. These can be combinations of numbers, letters, symbols, words, phrases, sentences. The password manager will do it for you. That way you know you are getting as secure a password as possible, but the best part is you don't even have to remember what it is. Um, it actually stores more than just passwords. Ever since adopting this at Good Shuffle over a year ago, I then enforced, I highly suggested my wife start to share, we share um, a password. Basically you can create these groups, right? I have an office group and I have a personal life group where my wife and I have a shared folder of logins. Um, but we can also share other information like uh, you, you could store a password, right? You could store your driver's license number in there. You can store, uh, you know, any kind of information that you generally wouldn't want anybody to ever have access to, it can be saved in there. And um, depending on your configurations, you can say, yes, my wife and I have access to this, but she accesses it from her own device. And we don't remember these words. Like we don't remember what the information is. That's the most important part because we are the weakest point in this level of security. When you go to these websites, it'll auto info and uh, auto fill out the information for you, which for me is phenomenal. I don't have to type anything, even with those sweet, Keyboard shortcuts I showed you earlier with the copy and paste, uh, we are talking about, it just says autofill and it just injects the information into the you know username and password and then you click login. It even has two factor authentication, right? For those of you that are, are using tools that have that feature available, it'll help you with that information too. And finally, device agnostic, right? This isn't something that you just download on your work computer. You can have it on your personal computer. You can have it on your phone. You can have it on your tablet. Works on all devices. Password manager is the single best tech trip tip I could uh, give you um, that I've experienced in the past two years. A password manager really, for me, was helped me overcome that struggle of reusing passwords, creating weak passwords, remembering that weird combination of numbers and letters I used for one specific password. All of that is gone. Uh, we liked it so much, we implemented it at Good Shuffle. Uh, and I'm sure everyone now can be either a somewhat evangelist of, of a password manager or very much an evangelist. So they're somewhat on the fence. You know, they, they won't be able to deny its utility and they won't be able to deny how it's helped them in certain situations. So some, some brands, uh, oh, I didn't even get to the screen. Sorry, so how does this all look, right? Over here on the right, these are actual passwords generated by my password manager. You know, it's all gobbledygook, other than maybe this one that is uh, like, you know, a, a series of um, words and phrases like, I didn't type them in. These are not passwords I actually use. I just clicked generate, 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 and I spat, it spat these out and impossible to remember. I would never remember any, not even the first three letters of any of these, much less the whole thing. What I remember, this is not my password, but this is what I have to remember is my password. That's how I, I log into one password and it gets me access to all those passwords that I've saved. It organizes them by website. Um, you can create tags, you can create groupings in there. It's really just a great organization tool. You remember one password, it remembers all the other ones. Phenomenal tool. Some brands out there, we use 1Password at Good Shuffle. LastPass has been in the game for a very long time. And Keeper, I saw really highly rated reviews online about Keeper. So um, some tools you should check out. If you've never even heard about a password manager, this is the first time, consider it. Maybe the next time you hear about it, you're like, all right, this is, this is the motivating factor for me to get one. But in today's day and age, you've got more important things to work on than like, what was your password to a website? Let's just be honest. We have a lot of bigger problems, a lot of bigger fish to fry than that darn web uh, password. So check out a password manager. Okay, questions? <laughs> I, let's see. Oh, there we go. All right, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot them in the chat or in the Q&A. We had a few that came throughout the session that we have already answered. Um, we did send out a help article on specifically how to add the bookmark or kind of button, sort of app looking part of Good Shuffle to your phone. I know a lot of people are really excited about that. But it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So Eric, thank you so much for every uh, everything you gave us for this information. Everyone is saying, 
these are great tips. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize that. So always a good sign. Uh, very, very, you know, very nice. This is a two-way street, um, right? Uh, you only learn about something until somebody else is like, darn it, you need to sit down and look at this. So if you guys are like, uh, you go, why didn't you talk about this? We'd love to hear it because the, any way we can get better, um, we're open, open to hear it. We just got someone who said they were hacked nine times in a year. So he's going to go get a password manager. Very glad to hear that the password managers are coming up next. I mean, that is, it is one of, unfortunately, those things that I think we all think isn't as important until you have something really bad happen. So, you know, try and get ahead, avoid the really bad thing happening. Yeah, uh, that, that sounds like a nightmare. Um, hopefully some of these steps will be able to mitigate that. And get some of your employees a second monitor. They will love you for it. You'll love it because, you know, we uh, we have, every time we have a new employee, we pretty much force them to have at least one other monitor uh, because we just know how much faster it makes you at your day-to-day -day job. And we want our employees to be moving as fast and doing as many things as they can. Yep. Very cool. Thanks again, there Eric. Really appreciate yep. it. Um, and there we go. We see somebody's already mentioning they can't go back to one monitor. We got another one is using uh, a triple 32 inch. So yes, the more screens, the merrier. Yeah, I've got the three in case you can't tell when I'm going like this and I'm going like this. It's because I have just a wall of monitors over here. So it's definitely, cool. I don't have a king size bed yet though. Now I think I'm going to have to uh, try that <laughs> three next. You know, that was a recent change in my life since we have two kids now. We're just like, how, how you know, how does this work? Uh, so I was like, uh, we need a bigger bed. And it's, it's like that time you go to a hotel and you sit in the king bed and you're like, oh, this is quite lovely. Yeah, right. it's not, <laughs> no going backwards. <laughs> yeah, for sure. People are saying king bed is a game changer. That might be next on my list. Everyone who doesn't have at least one monitor and monitors aren't that expensive. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there are some people and Eric, you may disagree with me on this, that I'm sure there are differences in quality, but, uh, I think you can get even a cheapo monitor and still feel the difference, even if it's you know not a super clear picture. Um, it's still going to yeah. give you space to drag something if you're just you know copying something that you want to type or take notes on. It's just a game changer, even for the cheapo ones. Yep, yep, definitely. I know my my wife. Uh, she's an attorney. She's got like the big, wide, round screen one, and she's like, "When when are you going to go pick that up for me?" She's still on maternity leave. She's like, "When are you going to go pick it up for me?" Like, I want it here at the house because I'm not going to go back. So, all right. Thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you took away some, a lot, or maybe somewhere in the middle, some tech tips. We're eager to hear about some tricks you guys have and, uh, and ways we can improve our digital and tech life. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again, Eric. Uh, I'm going yeah. to be diving right into our next session now. Um, Want to make sure that we are keeping things rolling to get our on-time finish.